This is the Trout Bitten Podcast. Trout Bitten. Trout Bitten? Trout Bitten. Trout Bitten. Trout Bitten? Yeah. Trout Bitten. Trout Bitten. It's about trout. Wild trout. This is Trout Bitten. So this is the Trout Bitten Podcast. Thanks for tuning in. My name is Dominic Swantoski. I'm the owner of Trout Bitten. I'm a fly fishing guide and the author of TroutBitten.com which is a very large resource for anglers interested in fly fishing for trout. Uh, Today, we're going to talk about wild trout and stock trout. My friends are here to join me, and I'll introduce them in a moment. But first, let me thank everyone out there who has supported this podcast since we launched. Uh, Your kind words and enthusiasm have been overwhelming and encouraging. It's great. Uh, To help keep this podcast growing, you can find the donate button at the bottom of every article on the Trout Bitten website. And just as importantly, you can subscribe to this podcast. Uh, Leave a comment and give it a five-star review on Apple Podcasts because those things are really what drive success in the podcast field. So thank you very much. Thanks again. All right, so now a little bit more about this topic of wild trout versus stocked. Uh, Back in 2016, I published an article on Trout Pit entitled The Hierarchy of Trout in Pennsylvania. And in that article, I argued that there is a clear order or a grading, so to speak, of the trout we catch. That order is wild trout, stocked fingerling, holdover trout, stocked trout, and clubfish. Tonight, we'll talk about each of these five kinds of trout that we catch, because this hierarchy holds up across the country not just here in Pennsylvania. Now, as I learned when I wrote the article, this topic can really be turned on its head and my meaning or my intentions often get misunderstood. I know that people can feel protective or defensive about the way they fish and the trout they catch. I get it. So let me say this as plainly and honestly as I can. All trout have value. The experiences we have catching trout has great value. And if you're having a great time catching trout, well, I mean, that's sort of the point. So that's excellent. Enjoy it. Get out there. Fish hard. Have fun. Catch trout. And yet, there's also nothing wrong with talking about all this and understanding that there are major differences in the trout we catch. Stock trout are often nothing like their wild counterparts. And that's true. But why does any of this matter? Why not just leave people alone and stop judging their fish, right? Let people go fish for what they want. Well, I agree, and we all agree with with all of that. We agree with it. But here's the thing. Overstocked fisheries often set up unrealistic expectations or ideas about what good trout fishing really is. And stock trout can honestly teach an angler bad habits. Perhaps most importantly, stock trout can do great harm to wild populations. Uh, We believe wild trout populations should be protected wherever they are found. That starts by eliminating the stocking of hatchery trout over wild trout. And it continues by finding struggling wild trout populations and helping them out, strengthening their numbers by improving water quality and habitat. Neither government nor private organizations should be permitted to stalk over established wild trout populations. Full stop. That's it. We believe that wild trout, wherever they are found, um, should be kept wild and given a chance. Keep wild trout wild. All right, one more thing before we get going here. Uh, The native versus non-native topic inevitably comes up in this kind of discussion, and that's fair. But we're not doing that today. I will simply say that here in Pennsylvania and in so many other places across the U.S., we are thankful for the introduction of the brown trout. Seriously, without it, many of our best trout rivers here would have no trout. None. As our our native brook trout simply cannot withstand the warmer water, the agriculture, and other pollution that the brown trout tolerates. Native trout are ideal. Yes, we acknowledge that. But in a changing world... Sometimes the only survivor is a non-native trout. All right, so how about some introductions here of my friends and a little bit of the question and answer round. 
Uh, here's our friend, Bill Dell. Um, Bill, what's your go-to fly rod these days, bud? I'd say my favorite. My favorite's a, a Scott Radian. It's a five weight, a little bit, a little bit heavy. But if I want to throw streamers, throw indicators, tight line nymph, that's my go-to rod. I didn't know you had a Scott rod. How come you never let me cast that? I keep it in the. I <laughs> keep serious. it in that rod vault away <laughs> from you. <laughs> that's right. <laughs> Bill now has a rod vault. Just so He's everybody a huge knows, fisherman. He is. Yes. He is. It's a nice rod it, vault. I have. I was trying to get a trout bit. Trying to get a trout bitten sticker for it, but I was uh, I was shut down. You don't have any stickers yet. <laughs> he has no stickers on his double tuber. What do you yeah, call it? Double rod's on board. <laughs> he is a huge trout fisherman. Uh, all right, Bill. Thanks for the answer, bud. And uh, yep. let me fish that. I didn't know you had it. Uh, yeah. Here's Austin. Austin Dando. Um, hey, Austin. What's the What's the last beer that you drank? Does the one I'm drinking now count? <laughs> Yes, it does. Okay. Yes, it does. Okay. Well, this is a Founders All Day IPA. The one I drank before this um, <laughs> was a Samuel Adams Oktoberfest. And how long ago was that? Uh, two hours ago. <laughs> <laughs> How'd you like that Oktoberfest? It's wonderful. You have to look forward to it every year. That's mm -hmm. true. I, I don't mind that Sam Adams beer. What's, the, what's your favorite? What's your favorite uh, craft beer? Oh, wow. Your own craft beer? Is that your new favorite? No, I won't say that. I'd say the, the biggest staple. Oh, mm. geez. Let's just say my all-time running favorite has been Bell's Too Hearted Ale. Right. That's a good one. It has a fish on the label. <laughs> it really does. Yeah. <laughs> we all like it. Yeah. But it is delicious. <laughs> it would be good with you, even without a fish on a label. Yep. That fish on the label looks yeah. dead. You think? Yeah. It, it, Tell us it was why. Handled I just thought, I've, whenever I've looked at it, I'm like, this is like a pale, dying fish. <laughs> That's Every so time wide. I see it. Every yeah. time I see it, I wish it was a brown trout. That's yeah. right. handled. It was I handled poorly. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> That's right. Go back to the last cat or the last yeah. podcast and think about how to handle a trout. <laughs> That's all I'm Take ever going to see picture. now when I drink that beer. <laughs> I think the That's Bells funny. folks will listen to this. And Yes, I do. I think every, yeah, they'll listen. Yeah. No, uh, Bill, you and I had, uh, what was it? Um, our friends Rex and Mike and, uh, and Dean, brothers, brothers, all brothers yesterday. Bill and I were guiding. Um, Treehouse Brewing Company, Julius Julius. That's, oh, that's the name. Have you guys had that? Yes. No. It's fantastic. How did you, where yeah, were they from? Good. Massachusetts or Connecticut? Yes. Yeah, like up that way. Oh, man. That's you a know. special thing. You should. That's right. That's what they said. You realize that. <laughs> what to, why is it ex, uh, why is those it special are to, those are those are very hard to come by so yeah. i didn't know this i didn't know this but i i yeah. enjoyed it they're like the the standard for new england style ipa um they don't distribute you can only get it on premise so either somebody waits in a line for That's a long time said. and get some and you get to yeah. try it or you go there yourself and you get it on draft but other than that it's uh it's very hard to get Huh? They were so, they were talking about two three hour wait times. Yeah, yeah. like to get in to buy yeah. it. They talked about a go, line. Yeah, they'll spend thousands of dollars and take you know milk carton crates home full and uh, buy it for their friends and yeah, it's it's a big deal. Huh? So yeah, those were true stories, Bill. Yes. We believe you now, Rex and Mike <laughs> and Dean. <laughs> All right, uh, here's uh, Josh Darling. Uh, Josh, how close are you to being a dad of three kids right now? Man, any minute. <laughs> any minute. <laughs> any minute. Due date's on Monday. Yeah. But, but uh, my wife is feeling it. Yep. Hey, uh, what's a good tip for an angler who wants a better camera than their iPhone for taking pictures on the water, but they don't want to spend thousands of dollars? I'm a Canon guy. So if, if you want kind of an intro level, pretty affordable camera, I'd say go with one of Canon's Rebel series. That's what I did. Yep. If you have a if you have a little bit more to spend and you want to enter the the mirrorless world, then then I've recommended the RP to a couple of you guys. That's what I did <laughs> yep. when I upgraded. Yeah. <laughs> Loaded question, I guess. I I might have known the answers. Uh, here's Trevor Smith. What's up, buddy? Hey now. Hey now. Hey, uh, what's a good strategy for fishing with kids? Do you think? Because I know Ooh. you do it. I was just out the other day. Yep. Um, yeah. So. I have a hiking backpack and 
and this is, you know, my kids are young still. My oldest is six and I've got down to two years old. Yeah. Um, six, four, two. And so right now fishing with them pretty much involves them watching me fish. Um, when I'm trout fishing, like on a stream, um, they're not quite old enough to handle a fly rod. I have taken them stock trout fishing yeah. and I've set up, you know, a rod with them with a bobber and we've had fun doing that. And I've also taken them out to my sister-in-law's, um, pond and she's got a bunch of catfish in there and some mm -hmm. bass and we've fished for those as well. And those are situations I can get them involved with a little bit more easily, but gosh, that hiking backpack's been such a valuable tool. And I think yeah, for <laughs> me, and actually Tom Rosenbauer had some things to say about this on, on the Orvis fly fishing podcast, but yeah. And just not burning kids out early by trying to have expectations for them that are unrealistic. And so I think I've gotten better at that as I've done it more. I don't think I was great to begin with, but doing maybe 20% fishing and 80% exploring and throwing rocks and, and, uh, yeah, just other things while I'm out there. So just yeah. trying to keep it fun for them, maybe get them some ice cream on the way home. So they tie yeah. that positive memory in. I know. <laughs> so, yeah, I know we've talked about this before a little yeah. bit on, uh, we've addressed it a little bit on other podcasts, but I get the question yeah. a lot. Hey, what, what age, you know, can I get my kids fishing? I'm like, yeah. And, uh, newborn, you know, absolutely. Just, yep. not fishing, but as we've said, sure. just out there, just out there, get them around water. Right. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I thought, I thought you're, we went fishing and you brought the kids and I thought the bucket idea was good. Bring the bucket along and pick up, interesting things yeah. along the bank rocks yeah, that is and cool. shells yep so that was a good idea by you yeah treasures yeah, yeah. they yeah. did a, yeah right exactly they did a good job with that and i know josh does this too he brings his kids down to the water a lot during the warmer season so yeah it's just yeah and yeah, you did it Dom, as an early age too yep yep and now joey uh just today we went fishing by himself we dropped him off and <laughs> i sent you guys the picture of him holding a fair size uh small mouth that he caught yeah. five of them he said on a ned rig mm -hmm. on a spinning rod which nice. is another point i mean it does in my opinion it doesn't matter as long as they're fishing and learning and having fun that's it catch fish like you said take them yep. to a pond catch uh pan yeah. fish and whatever don't be yep. too uh, i don't think uh, don't be too obsessed about trout on a fly rod and you'll yeah. get there you know what i mean yeah. fish they just want to see fish I, yep. I spent some time talking to greg about that ned ned rig and yeah trying to i think i might tie some flies on one <laughs> i know on, the, on that jig hook i know it would work uh all right guys let's take a very short break and we'll be right back to talk about wild and stock trout fulling mill is the world's leading producer of flies fly boxes hooks beads and tippet Known for their barbless hooks, they have many of your favorite trout patterns tied barbless. Not only that, they feature patterns from anglers like George Daniel, Pat Weiss, Josh Miller, Joe Goodspeed, and many others from around the world. Every pattern is backed by the 200% fulling mill guarantee. If a fly isn't up to the highest standards that you expect, they will replace it with two that are. Stock up at FullingMill.com or ask for the flies at your local dealer. So why do wild trout matter? I mean, I wrote an article on trout pitting a few years ago with the title, Why Wild Trout Matter. And I asked at least a dozen of my fishing friends for the answer. What I got back were a dozen different excellent answers. And yet, with, within each of those answers was, was the intrinsic understanding that a wild trout holds more value than a stock trout. Why? Because it's real, they said. Because it's adaptable. Because it holds the evolutionary genetics for surviving in its own river system because it is a strong and lasting creature because wild trout are most often uh, more challenging to catch sometimes they're harder to find because they are survivors uh, because wild trout are a symbol of nature's persistence against human intervention and a wild trout in all its beauty is simply wild what do you think guys what do you think I agree. Um, when I have a, there's a, there's definitely a special place in my heart for stocked fish because it's what hooked me. It's, it's what got me into it. And, um, but man, when I moved to Pennsylvania yeah, and got to, for the first time, experience the difficulty of, of catching a wild trout, 
It's like you were saying in the intro that stocked fish had kind of ruined my expectations for what good fishing was. And so when I moved here and realized how difficult it actually was, uh, they it kind of raised that fish on a pedestal. I'm like, this is mm. this is a better fish. They're harder to catch. They're smarter. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, yeah. I have a similar uh, kind of experience to Josh where I grew up um, mostly stocked fish. There wasn't many of them that would survive very long past the spring. And that's what I was always used to catching. And when I got to the central PA area, you know, every trout I caught, whether it was, uh, or every wild trout I caught for that matter, whether it was really small or really big, they were all so exciting because, you know, to me, they were born in the stream. It was the real thing. Yeah. Yeah. And I still feel that way to this day. Every time I catch one, I mm -hmm. still get excited or something special about it. That's all. When I first got into, when I really got into fly fishing, I started fishing central PA and there were wild trout. And I feel like for the most part, I think they were more predictable because yeah i agree they, with that you know they're gonna bugs are gonna hatch they're gonna eat them and i got used to learn kind of that process i came back home to, to western pa and there's a lot more stock trout yeah and went to some local streams that were primarily stock trout mm -hmm. and bugs were hatching and i was ready you know i had all my right mayflies to match that hatch and yeah. uh Oh, the yeah. stock trout wanted nothing to do with that. They wanted a <laughs> shiny pink worm coming Sometimes, down yeah, that's right, yeah. And so it frustrated me at times. Yeah, I think what you said about predictability, for me, when I was fishing Western PA, that's where I grew up too, and mostly for stock trout, um, lots of times I didn't know if they were there. I mean, you know, they were put and take streams, and lots of times you'd be going, man, are, are there, did they stock this? Did they float stock this? Are there fish here? Were they fished out? And the beauty to me of a wild trout fishery is that well like austin said it's sustainable they are there they're born in the stream and yeah if i do the right things i mean i have to, it's easy to believe that there are trout uh seeing your flies on every cast but that is not the same predictability in a stock trout stream i think that's a really good point i like that you know i love that's one thing that, things i love about fishing wild trout I think it's like the nice, we put so much time and effort into learning so much about the tactics that we use and perfecting the craft that I feel like it's the natural, like fulfillment of that effort and work when you catch a wild fish that it sort of justifies the, the means yeah. that we use to fish for them. Because if, if you do go through all that work and you're worried about all this line and leader and how it falls and then the fish doesn't care if you drag it across the surface and it's just going to eat anything you throw over it i mean who cares why are we doing why are we making it harder on ourselves yeah and you know we can all acknowledge that sometimes well, like bill said stock trout do odd things it's hard to understand what they want you to do and yet as he said there's they're more predictable in their behaviors and they sort of do the right things let's say and stock trout can do the same thing i know we'll get into that uh stock trout can become you know they can act pretty darn wild at times uh so this so part of me wants to avoid the word hierarchy because it sounds stuffy or here's the word again elitist um but that's not what we're doing here um yes there's a natural order to things and it's it's a good exercise to acknowledge it but each of us fishes for all types of trout that's what we're saying i grew up fishing for stock trout that's what we are we're talking about here and i still do i fish for stock trout quite a bit throughout the year um i've fished for clubs or i've fished clubs a few times um and i enjoy trying to find good holdover fish which we're going to talk about and every trout that i catch is a great time <laughs> i almost yeah i mean it's always fun um but i also think it's important to acknowledge or realize that uh to, to just to understand what kind of trout we're chasing i mean um, I, I approach stock trout with different tactics than I do wild. We just kind of mentioned that. I really do. I, I, I'm thinking, okay, I'm fishing over stock trout right here. And are they fresh, freshly stock trout? Do I think they're mostly holdovers or are these all wild trout? Um, and I, but here's the point too. I do not value a 20 inch club fish in the same way that I do a wild whiskey. And I know you guys feel the same way. Um, I'm simply not as excited in that 
same way as I am, you know, you know as, as if it was wild. So here's the order of things. Um, this is what we're going to talk about. Wild trout. We're acknowledging that that's at the top of the list. Then stocked fingerling, um, holdover trout, stockies or stock trout, just general stock trout. Um, and then clubfish. Uh, Trevor, will you tell us a little bit about wild trout? I sure will. So in our eyes, the best trout is the one that nature has created. Mm. It's stream born and it's wild. Through natural selection, populations of wild trout have adapted to their environments generation upon generation. And a wild trout deals with the impending predation from the beginning, and it tracks down food at the same time. Their unassisted start in life creates a strong fish that reacts and moves in concert with the stream and the life around it. It lives where it's supposed to live, and it eats what it's mm. supposed to eat. Nice. A wild trout's a natural part of its ecosystem. What do you guys think? No, oh, I love that. Yeah. I remember Bill Anderson uh, from the Little Juniata River Association. I guess he's the president, maybe the founder of that. Uh, remember him telling me how th this was impressive. He believes, and I, I think we all would agree with this, that the wild trout in there, uh, let's say when the temperature sometimes on the in the warmest summers will get, let's say even up to 72, 75, those trout, they start to migrate. <laughs> You know, they and they, but those trout genetically understand, they know in their genes, they somehow know where to go find those cold water resources. And yet, a stock trout that you put in there isn't going to know that. That's a very special thing for a wild trout to know the river system that it's in <laughs> at birth. Yeah, absolutely. We, we have the option to seek out wild trout, and there's just this kind of cool, I mean, wild trout they don't have a choice right over the environment in which they're born into. And so I just love that as you think about pursuing and catching wild trout, you're really trying to put yourself in that survivalist mindset, you mm. know, as you approach a stream and that looks different in every state. And here in Pennsylvania, you're thinking about what predation is natural to us, whether that be from birds or, you know, aquatic mammals and things like that. It's just, I think it's a cool thing to think through. It's kind of a natural, uh, uh, partner for how we want to fish absolutely uh, yeah they certainly can survive i mean i there have been so many summers or even harsh winters where i go whoo man you know what's the population going to be like they make it but but honestly most of the stock trout don't and that's just the truth mm. now don when you guide do you see a lot of guys coming in with so much experience with non-wild fish that it's hard for them to adjust to our waterways here or do you not see a lot of that? Yeah, uh, I do see the I do see a lot of that, and even let's say wild fish. We've touched on this a little bit before that are from regions where there is a short feeding season. Um, mm. Anyway, I guess I'm I'm saying that so often I hear people say, "Man, these trout are tough. Man, why these trout are really picky?" People will often assume it's because of angler pressure, but I don't. I mean, in my opinion, it's not angler pressure. First of all, I don't think there is that much around here. Uh, there's plenty of room to spread out. But it's not angler pressure. It's that, that they have, they can feed all year round. And um, yeah, that they're wild. And a lot of people are coming from areas that, you know, where there's, they're mostly fishing for stocked fish. Mm -hmm. And we're not saying that all stocked fish are easy either. No, nobody here is saying that. But there is sure. a market difference, I think. Yep. Um, Josh, will you tell us a little bit about stocked fingerlings? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, in this in this hierarchy, as we're calling it, I think fingerlings are probably the most likely to be confused for wild trout. Sure. And this is because they're the, the closest that a trout can get to being wild without actually being born of the river. Uh, fingerlings begin life in the hatchery, but they're released into a river system at around three to six inches, usually. Mm -hmm. Um if a fingerling survives the you know the truck drive and the mm -hmm. plunge and the seasons of competition that it takes to grow to maturity, it will have generally uh, adopted many of the physical and behavioral traits of a wild trout, having been sure yeah. molded by the same environment and sustained by the same insects. Mm -hmm. uh, a healthy stocked fingerling, I think, could fool even a, a seasoned angler at times. Sure. Um, yep. but you know, the, the vast majority 
don't survive to maturity. For no shortage of reasons, from bad genetics to predation, most fringlings don't last long. And, mm. and those that do, as we've kind of talked about already, will never earn the title of wild. They still have the the stocky gene, and uh, you uh, you can't choose your parents. <laughs> no, yeah. very much so. Yeah. Um, anybody know about like the rate of return? I think it's super small for those yeah. because they're most times they're dumping them into you know a river that may be a little bit warmer, may not have wild trout in it, mm-hmm. and you also have other things like bass and walleye or something else in that river, and you know dumping those fish in is like ringing the dinner bell for those. <laughs> because they don't have yeah, and they don't have the instincts to uh, well. Yeah, they don't know how to protect themselves necessarily. I remember Bill Anderson telling me again, it was like the rate of return is like 2%. And I, I think you can look that up on uh, Fish Commissions uh, and not just PA. The rate of, rate of return, meaning after after a year, I believe it is, is somewhere around 2%. Man, and I believe that. Yeah. You can look, I should mention this book right away. Um, uh, Anders Halverson, uh, An Entirely Synthetic Fish is one of the best, well, it is the best book, best resource I've ever found for all this is extremely thorough. It's completely researched. It's uh, well documented. There's a huge bibliography in the back. The guy did his research and he wrote a very entertaining book too. So check that out. I mean, if you have questions about this or if you're skeptical about, well, what are they, what do these guys know? I don't know. I mean, <laughs> we fished a lot and uh, we do have that experience, but then, yeah, you can back it up with those kind of resources. And, and yeah. I, th- I think, uh, one of the things some of the local rivers rivers around here trying to push the the fish commission to stock less yeah. fish at that finger length level but uh lo- like larger ones yeah because the survivability rate was higher so instead of like that three to six mm-hmm. i think they're looking like six to ten mm-hmm. somewhere in that range because the survivability rate would be higher for those fish and i've i've heard the same thing for both trout and uh, surprisingly musky as well, mm. because they're kind of in that same, you know, you put them into the waterway, the bigger they are, the better chance they are to not be eaten by something else. Yeah, that makes sense. You know, those some, ones will not, uh, those ones will not fool anglers the same way. <laughs> no. no, that's part, that's part of it. If they're stocked that young and they survive, that's what makes them yeah. seem kind of wild and act kind of wild. If yeah. You stock you. them at 10 inches. That's not going to be the case. That's true. Uh, hey, I do. This is a good time to bring this up. Um, the fact that not all hatchery trout are created equal. Um, mm-hmm. We all acknowledge well, that's this. True, also. You know, uh, we don't really have a section for this. So let me interject it. Uh, the first, uh, first, the the vast majority of stock trout, um, stocked fish are coming from the state or large hatcheries like the kinds that we've been talking about. It's it's what you think of when you think of a stocky. Okay, and so. so these are trout that have been genetically selected to feed aggressively and grow fast um, through the years. You know, they're the ones that survive in the hatcheries the best. So they're, they're the ones they raise. Um, they are used to humans. They live in large schools. But some um, private hatcheries do things differently. Um, and they raise some very nice looking fish. Um, likewise, there are a few stocking programs across the U.S. that take eggs and milk from wild river fish. Um, those eggs hatch and the trout are raised in the hatchery before being stocked back in the river system. Now, they might be raised to fingerling length. They might be raised to, let's, they call them catchable length, let's say 10 or 12. They might be raised to even 16, 18 inches. I don't know. Um, but again, they come from those wild directly, come directly from those wild genes. Um, that's about as close as you're going to get, I mean, to a wild fish. It's very wild. Mm. Uh, but still, the trout lives, again, part of its life in a hatchery. And I will also mention, these are rare stocking programs, and it's not the norm um, because they're expensive and labor-intensive. But as far as the value in those fish, mm-hmm. uh, we have quite a few rivers around here that just won't sustain wild trout populations, but they the rivers stay cold enough so that those finger links can grow. Yeah. And so they're beautiful rivers to be on. And so it, it adds more value to that river to be able to catch more catch fish out of while you're floating the river, wading the river. And so that's a great point. You know, you 
it, it gets more people outdoors around this area. Mm-hmm. So it's a good thing, in my opinion. Ab- you mean fingerlings in general? Yeah. Yes. Yes. Yeah. Fingerlings in general. Absolutely. Because if the if those fingerlings or if the stock trout weren't there, like you say, you know, you wouldn't have those kind of opportunities. That's cool. What do you think from a genetic standpoint does less harm to the wild population, the stocked fingerlings that grow up and then interbreed or stocked fish that are stocked as adults? For your question, it's got to be fingerlings, right? Yeah. It's got to do less right. harm. Yeah. Yeah, because the survive of the, yeah. the ones that survive, right? They've probably got the most yeah. close to wild genetics. Yeah. Or the most suited yeah. to survivability, right? So even right. if they interbreed, they're adding something yeah. to the genetic pool rather than detracting. I, Bill. Uh, I don't know. Don't Bill know. has thoughts. <laughs> Go ahead, so, Bill. So From the analyst. Yeah, so from the analyst here. So I don't think the – like if the fingerlings are breeding with right. – like let's say they grow up, I don't want them interjecting their stocky genes, so to speak, into – the natural selection right. of nature that's out there. Um, but I will say that uh, let's say they dump a 20 inch stock trout into a small brook trout stream that isn't quite class A, mm. that 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 20 inch whatever fish that was stocked could eat several of the smaller brook trout yeah. and it's going to do a much bigger damage to that fishery. I want to say, too, you're going to have a lot of people telling you that oh, stock trout are uh, sterile. Um, I've had lots of people tell me that all stock trout are sterile. That's not true, but uh, plenty of them are, or they're, they're supposed to be, you know, and so they can't, they can't let's say, affect uh, the, the natural selection, as you're, as you're saying, Bill. You know, they're not going to uh, screw up the gene pool. Um, that's a good thing. That's a good way to do it. You know, if you're going to stock over wild trout, which we don't, we don't want to do, um, at least if they'd be sterile. Mm-hmm. I know I've watched rainbows paired up in the spring in, in central Pennsylvania. Really? Yeah. Yeah. Multiple and we don't times. have, just to clarify, like we don't have wild rainbows in, in PA. Right, but they're You're trying talking about stock the fish. <laughs> yeah, right on. <laughs> yeah, we'll try. Uh, yeah. I, yeah. I, 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 there's wild rainbows in PA, maybe not in your area. I shouldn't have said that. Yeah, we don't have, right, Boston. in this area. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> there's a limited, yeah, there's a limited list. Anyway, somebody's typing a comment already. <laughs> yeah, that's right. That's right. So um, next on the list is the holdover trout. Uh, these are stocked adult trout that make it past the first season. Commonly, anglers use the term holdover for a trout that was stocked the previous year. Uh, but I've also heard the term used for a trout that makes it from spring into fall, let's say. Now, whatever the definition, the prevailing qualities are longevity and duration. Holdovers are stocked fish that have survived angling pressure, natural predation, rough weather, and varying stream conditions, um, during which time they tend to take on more natural, wild appearances and habits. Having made it past the gauntlet of natural selection, a holdover is the best of the best stock trout. Or <laughs> it just got really lucky. <laughs> yes. Uh, holdover trout may have short or nubby fins. And so if you if you catch a fish that has, you know, half the fin missing or the entire fin missing, it might be a good indicator that it's a holdover fish. Pretty good. Uh, blocky spots. So uh, I kind of, when I say blocky spots, I almost think of something as like a, you know, a, a digital print of something. Yeah. It's, and the, uh, the other kind of easy indicator at times will be, the uh, the spots won't have halos or rings around them. Yeah, I would say like the only uh, for sure one there. The only sh- for sure indicator is the nubby fins, the rubbed up nose like that. You know, if they have half a tail because <laughs> he was <laughs> rubbing it against the concrete tank uh, for most of his life and he didn't grow it back. Yeah, that's a it, those stockies are pretty easy to see. I'd say a soft mouth too is also kind of a giveaway. Um, and and well, okay. We're talking about holdovers, and that that soft mouth uh, that I am talking about, that kind of goes away over time, but not on big, in my experience, not on fish that were stocked large. They were stocked, let's say, at like 14, 15, 16 inches, and you're catching them at 17 or 18 inches. They still kind of have a soft mouth, almost like, again, soft teeth. 
Have you guys mm-hmm. noticed that when you're taking the hook out? It's different. Yeah. It's just Definitely. different. To me, that's almost a dead giveaway. And one of the other things that kind of, you know, through experience I've kind of noticed is yeah. a lot of those fish are disproportionate. So you might have a huge body with this small head. Oh, yeah. Or just, I don't know. It almost looks like the fish was on steroids where it has like, you know, excessively hooked jaw. Um, mm-hmm. Extreme you know. features. Yes. yes, exactly. That big body, small head thing is, is is kind of the opposite of like what you'll find in, well, a lot of our upstate, uh, let's say, wild brook trout. You know, you kind of have big heads and small bodies. That's very uh, yeah. infertile streams that they're in. And, you know, the, well, that's what happens. But in the other, what Bill's talking about, you know, they, they started their life being overfed. <laughs> and so their bodies kind of, mm, they, they grow to large sizes and their heads are not catching up. Mm. Yeah. Right. So I guess the the question I have to the to the group here is what value do you think the uh, the holdover fish brings to fly fishing? I think for people that are fishing stocked waterways, you know, having fish hold over and survive through to that next year at least provides a fish that is slightly more wild than it was the year prior. You know, at first stocking, and so. Mm-hmm. Not only does it add maybe a fish of better size, but it also adds a fish that's a little bit, it's going to teach them something a little bit, hopefully, maybe a little bit more natural um, about a trout. I would agree with Trevor. I would just add uh, to the point where he said a stocked waterway. I think it adds to the stocked waterway if there are no other wild trout there. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah. Good, so, good qualification. Yeah. So if, yeah. they, uh, you know, if they hold over and you can catch them the next season, you know, that's pretty fun. Yeah, it is. that's a good point. I, there, there are some streams around me that no chance of any wild trout living through, but they stay cold enough, and so it does. It gives you something to do. It does. It's exciting. Like, like, like Austin just said, it's it's fun, and that's the value to me. Is that it's fun. You, when I catch one, I go, "Ooh, that looks like a holdover." Hey, that 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 trout's been in there for a while. And I said, I I fish for stocked fish on a fairly regular basis. You know, a lot of times in the spring, but I'll fish stock streams when I want to keep trout. Cause I don't feel bad about it. I don't really keep wild trout and I'm planning on keeping them and I catch a holdover and I go, Ooh, that meat's going to be nice. And it's true. I don't know if you guys have, you know, uh, cut them open and yeah. fillet them, yeah, but that absolutely. meat is, it looks, it looks Has wild. More color. It does. Yeah. And it honestly, yep. uh, it tastes wild. The other question I have to the, uh, the group here is what harm do you think they cause to trout fisheries, waterways? The holdovers in particular, I, it, let's let's say there's a small wild population. Well, yeah. Anytime you're putting stock trout on top of wild trout, that's not good. You know, we talked about how uh, if they're not sterile, they're gonna you know weaken the gene pool. But I mean, you can find studies about how the the stock trout don't follow the rules. They they don't know the rules. They're following hatchery trout rules, so they're kicking out uh, wild trout. They're trying to kick out wild trout from prime spots. And so let's say prime wild trout, Mister Twenty Inch Trout. It's been there for a long time and you put a bucket of, you know, 10 inch stockies on, on top of them or in his area, they go swim around them and he spends all day trying to kick out those, uh, exerting energy and trying to kick out those 10 inch wild trout. That's just a small instead, example. Instead of eating and getting to be a namer. Yeah, exactly. So to me, it does create frustration at times because if I'm, if I'm on a wild trout fishery mm. and I'm expecting to catch some wild trout and I hit this prime spot, make, you know, make a good cast. The, uh, the fly comes through, something eats it, set the hook. And I'm like, Oh, good fish. Get the net out. And next thing you know, it's a stock rainbow coming to the net where I thought it was a big brookie. It's a little bit disappointing at times. That's kind of it, right? Oh we've, yeah. We've talked so many times about, uh, it's disappointing that in many of the places we fish, you don't know if it's wild or stocked because somewhere far down below, you know, yep. there's a stocked section of river and sometimes they stock, they stock browns and we don't know with it, this nice brown that we caught, it looks totally wild. And I'm not a hundred percent sure there, there it, is that disappointment factor. That's oh, a, yeah. that's a great point because my next question was how do they cause confusion? That's it. Right. In fly fishing. And that's exactly what it is. Yeah. You just don't know sure. sometimes. I think the neat thing about Montana that we all recognize is, you know, if, if it's a river trout, it's wild, right? Yeah. And I think back to the, what detriment they could cause the angler 
you know, if you're looking for clues as to what the trout are keying on that day, or you're looking for feeding behavior or what water type they're holding in, yeah. if you're taking your cues from a holdover fish in a waterway that has wild fish, you might be led astray unknowingly. And, mm. and you know, it just kind of leads to, like you said, more confusion, Bill. Yep. So uh, sort of next on the list here is just the, the stock trout, the stocky, the standard hatchery trout that let's say is stocked at eight, nine, 10, 11, 12, maybe 14 inches, you know, your standard stocky. Um, I grew up fishing for stock fish in Western Pennsylvania. Uh, there were precious few wild trout in my area. And without the stockies, I would not have learned to trout fish. I wouldn't be talking about trout right now if it wasn't for those fish. That's great value right there. Um, and that is the stockies value. That, and that should be the stockies purpose, to populate rivers that cannot support wild trout. And certainly, I do not mean that every troutless river should receive hatchery trout. Not at all. Uh, but, it, but if it's the kind of river that once held trout before human beings sort of screwed it up, then it's probably a pretty decent choice for stocking. That's not for me to decide, you know, leave that to the fishery scientists. But um, hatchery fish or stockies are genetically selected to feed aggressively and grow quickly. We talked about that. They've, they've lived their entire lives in an artificial environment, often in overcrowded concrete troughs. Honestly, everybody here should, everybody listening, take a tour through a hatchery sometime. It just gives you an idea of, of what you're going to be fishing for if you're fishing for stock trout. Uh, they frequently do have deformities, uh, such as stubby fins or rub snouts or mangled tails, especially if they're really crowded. Often I'm going to say state hatcheries are like that. Uh, private hatcheries, not so much necessarily, you know, these are generalizations and stock trout eat, uh, brown hatchery pellets that are similar to dry dog food. My boys and I used to, I mean, we still do once in a while, uh, take, tours or whatever it's not a tour you just go in and they'll give you a bucket of uh the food the trout food and you throw them in and the hatchery fish come in, come up and eat it um anyway so the flesh and the skin colors are often nothing like a wild fish because of what they're eating what my boys and i would throw into the water and they'd eat and they were eager to eat um in a hatchery these trout do not learn to use cover or to feed selectively or to play by the rules of a natural trout stream like we said earlier Instead of shying away from people, my boys and I, from overhead movement, as we'd throw those, those pellets in, um, they didn't see us as a threat. They often learned to associate it with incoming food. The larger the hatchery trout is when stocked, the longer it has played by the artificial rules of a hatchery. And quite frankly, the dumber it will be when released into a real trout stream. I mean, that's it. That's fair. Simply put, large stockies are not trophies. Fun to catch. Sure, absolutely. They're fun to catch. But are they rare, extremely special, or full of exceptional value? I mean, I say no. Frankly, they're, they're not. They just aren't. Um, not, like a, not like a wild trout. We've talked about the value that the stockies have. Um, but I think they should fill a specific role, providing anglers opportunities where wild trout cannot thrive. And hatchery trout should not be stocked over healthy wild trout populations. They're a good thing for kids because like you talked about, they're eager, their willingness to eat things. And so getting a, getting a young kid into fishing, you know, having the ability to let them catch more fish is a great value. My response to that though, I have to be careful about that because again, so the adults in Western PA are also fishing for those trout because that's what they have in front of them. And you know, there are plenty of, plenty of Southern states that don't have wild trout, maybe in a few tailwaters. Whatever people have in front of them, if they if that that's what they have, they're going to fish. And they don't like. I mean, they don't like hearing us say that their stock trout are lesser than the wild trout. I mean, I think what we're saying here is that it is true. I don't want to tell them that they're just for kids. You know what I mean? But I get, I also get your point. Around here, around here, it's a it's a really great way to introduce a kid to fishing because around here those trout are going to be easier but they aren't always easier either i think one of the obvious questions out of this discussion is like in pennsylvania where we live there is still stocking over wild populations and what kind of pressures do you guys think exist for that practice to continue oh yeah you mean pressure from local 
Uh, yeah. Yeah. And yeah, uh, landowners. Who are the especially? factors? Yeah. Yeah. What, what and who are influencing? Yeah. Yeah. We have a lot of landowners that are happy that you stock their land. And if you stop stocking their land, they threaten that they will post their land and not let other anglers mm -hmm. on it. And, you know, I'm sure that's a valid point. For, the Fish Commission points that out all the time. Well, if we stop stocking it, it's going to get posted. Yeah. I say stop stocking it anyway. To a degree, they're they're right. I mean, I know I've seen that happen on my water here where yeah. there is popular access we all of us used to enjoy where they changed some regulations a couple of years ago. And as retaliation, the folks who had cabins and places along the creek yep. uh, followed through with their threat, as you could say. Yep. And uh, now you either have to start way below or way above and hike down or up to get to that same water. So, mm -hmm. I mean, not that it's a, a legit reason to stock versus not stock, but that mm -hmm. definitely does happen. So that's a big pressure. I mean, you know, access, you know, and here in PA, and it's like this a lot of places in the country, you know, you, you can post your river uh, as long as it's not navigable. Yeah, it's unfortunate. Because it, there is almost a blackmail kind of situation <laughs> blackmail, there in I like, some cases, right? That's a good yeah. way to, that's true. Yeah. yeah. It is unfortunate. Or they're holding, holding streams hostage. Because I think a lot of the, the, the requirements in our state for the state to stock it, I think there needs to be public access. Mm -hmm. Right, right. Mm -hmm. And so they're yep. kind of, it's kind of a double-edged sword there. Mm -hmm. Right, right. And so, Austin, will you tell us about clubfish? Tell us a little bit about clubfish. All right. So, uh, clubfish is a term we use to describe uh, an artificial setup mm. uh, where the trout are not only stocked, but also fed by humans. Um, and sometimes can in, uh, contain to an area of water, but most times they're not. Um, yeah. The clubfish that are stocked usually start at least within the mid teens, sometimes, you know, pushing 20. Um, and grow rapidly from there. Uh, once again, this rapid growth is due to trout being continually fed, uh, hand-fed pellets. Um, yeah. As we mentioned, they vaguely or quite accurately resemble dog food. Um, the idea of a club fishery is to manufacture a large trout uh, that folks will want to come and catch, most often for a fee. Um, now, if that is what you love to do, you know, so be it. Go ahead and enjoy that. Yes. Where it becomes an issue for me and for us, as we spoke before, is where it interferes with our wild trout populations. Um, in central PA and the surrounding regions, we have club fisheries within our very own Class A streams, and yes. that is a problem. Um, when we add a club fish to a wild population, we seldom improve that habitat. Probably never in reality. Yeah. I've watched stream access get taken away due to the entrance of a new club. I've caught these fish far beyond the reaches of the planning. I've caught wild fish that have become trained into a club fish mentality. Ooh. Perhaps one of the worst things is some clubs are producing really good looking trout. Yeah. Um, and at times that's darn difficult to tell the difference from a wild counterpart. They're not just all overfed rainbows. This cast, cast doubt onto larger trout we catch in our wild rivers. None of us yeah. want to deal with that. Um, you know, so what's everybody's stance on clubfish? Do they have a time and a place? Should they be in wild water? You know, what are the thoughts? So, so I have one addition to that clubfish. What I see a lot around this area is it may not necessarily be pay to fish, but a lot of times maybe a sportsman's club, you know, mm -hmm. hey, uh, everybody donate, you know, $10. We'll have a, uh, we'll stock, you know, the West branch of Laurel Run with you know 50 20 inch fish and we'll have a trout derby yeah and so sometimes that you know west branch laurel run ends up being uh, a nice brook trout fishery that they're dumping a bunch of club fish mm -hmm. into and there's a big detriment there agreed mm -hmm. that was a good description austin i guess what stuck out to me is the disappointment really uh i know the places you're talking about where, yeah. you know, there didn't used to be a club there, and now there is, and now there's some artificial, well, there's a lot of artificial influence, and now you'd be fishing two miles upstream or downstream, and you catch a really nice brown, and you go, hmm, is that yeah. really wild? And it matters whether it's really wild or not, for all the reasons we've already talked about. And the crazy thing is, you know, some of these clubs are very popular, and yes. everybody knows about them. Mm -hmm. But there's also clubs within 
our area that people don't know exist at all. So almost all of our blue ribbon streams, when I say all, you know, four or five of them around. Yep. Yep. Somewhere within them host at least a style of a club fishery mm -hmm. within the tributary system and whatnot. Yep. Yeah. Or even mm -hmm. the main branch yeah. itself. Yes. Right. Like they are there. And I think that's really where I would take offense at it too, is because it provides an incentive to take over some of the stream that should be by all rights wild and should be accessible or could be accessible, but it's another thing competing for our access and then also, you know, screwing with the wild population. Mm -hmm. And the wild trout experience really. Yeah. Like we're saying yeah. of, of, of as anglers. I, I was fishing a, I was fishing a river. I think it was about two years ago and I busted my butt to, to wade into position in a, in a, in a spot where I had just thought, man, this is going to hold a good Brown. And I set the hook and I was like, Oh, this is a really good fish. And, you know, got pumped, excited, netted, got to fish close and realized it was a rainbow. It was a big rainbow, like 22, yeah. 23 inch rainbow. And that was a, to me, it looked like it, you know, I had, I hadn't caught a rainbow in that section and it was probably eight to 10 miles away from a club water, but it was just so evident that that's what that fish was. Yes. And it was just so frustrating there's a difference to me, whether I don't care if that fish is 20 inches or, you know, 25 inches or whatever. If it's, if it's a stocked fish, I would have rather caught a 12 inch Brown out of that run just because it's frustrating. I think the thing is there's, there's no gate in the river there's no fence in the river that is going to contain that club so i well i kind of find it offensive or unfortunate that uh yeah they're going to have a club upstream totally legal guy the the owners uh own the own the stream they can unfortunately do what they want with it and yet everything they do is going to affect the entire river system as bill's describing like we're talking about miles and miles below and above what do you guys think about though what, what let's say and I'm thinking of a of a place in Western PA that I used to fish as a kid, and then, oh, I mean, a guy a guy bought it, privatized the whole thing. Now this was not a wild trout fishery; it was a state stocked fishery, and it was some of our favorite water. And um, and now it's very heavily stocked. It's, it's a club, and um, what's the what's the harm in that, guys? What's the problem with that? Most, I mean, it's not you're not affecting wild trout anymore. What's the problem? I guess I see it. When you see it on social media, sometimes it's frustrating mm -hmm. because you see, hey, this guy's holding up, you know, a 20 plus inch fish mm -hmm. that came from a bucket 15 minutes ago that would eat anything. And then the guy that's busting his butt out there, uh, struggling and working his way and catching 10 to 15 inch fish feels like, oh man, you know, I didn't, I didn't catch a big enough fish, you know, that. I think there's that perception of just because it's a big fish, it's more valuable and mm -hmm. important instead of what are the origins of that fish. The origins is a good point. Yeah. yeah. Well, yeah, but just it's, like we were talking about earlier, it really does warp the perception of what fishing should be. The expectations. Yeah. 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 And that's, and that's, that's really through social media now with streams like that, that really is through social media because everybody's getting, their their take on what fishing should be and their expectations on what they're going to catch based on social media right now especially if they're not living on a stream and so you see stuff like that and and then all of a sudden like you're expecting a, a 22 inch trout when you go out yeah extremely rare yeah you're this thinking is, where's my 22 inch trout right. right this is why we need things like the ffbi that's right. <laughs> there you go. The most Shout recent out to the FFBI. <laughs> the most recent of the call out. We're all big culture. fans. <laughs> sure. We're all big fans. You know, and well, I think, that's the thing is, yeah. Go ahead, in Austin. Oh, yeah. I was just going to say that. Um, <laughs> that's good. I think over the years, too, that as uh, people have gotten more used to seeing that uh, style of photo, it's become a little easier to, to notice. Like well, for us, day, oh yeah, we know. Yeah, <laughs> for us, but like, right? But in like 2012 everybody. or something, when not a lot of people were posting fish pics, yeah, you know, there was like five guys out there putting them out. You, yeah. know, you might, you know, the perception or the the, uh, you know, how believable what they were doing was legit might have been a little bit 
more Believable. than it is now. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I just think that's funny. Just to clarify, the FFBI stands for Fly Fishing Bureau of Investigations. <laughs> <laughs> it's fantastic. They, te- they tend to call out uh, anglers who will be holding stock or club fish and possibly passing them out off as, uh, you know, wild trout. Can I just yep. point out, uh, so I have a friend who, oh, I, we, we were hanging out one night and he showed me a picture. He goes, oh, I caught a huge trout. You know, let's say 22 inches, probably bigger than that. Huge trout. Look at this. And he showed me the picture. And as he's showing me the picture, he goes, well, that was that was spruce creek, so you know what that's about. And and I was like, yeah. He goes, but it was fun, though. And you know what? There you go. I mean, I know where he's fishing. We all know where he's fishing. And that's a club. And he knew he was going club fishing. And he decided to go and have a good time. And he caught it. Cool. And you know what? When he told me, he's like, I had it. I, I had a blast catching this trout, but he also wasn't like, oh man, here's you know, the best wild brown trout I've ever caught, you know? And so you got to go back to knowing what you're fishing, knowing where you're fishing, what you're fishing for. Um, and, you know, I guess why you're fishing for it and, you know, how, what do you expect the experience to be? I mean, I, like I said, I'll fish, I'll fish for anything. I have a lot of fun doing it. But he was honest about it. That's what I'm I saying. That- yeah. That was a big. That was a big point there. Yeah. All right. So, uh, anything else, guys? Anything else you want to highlight? Talk about? I've noticed on uh, on on things like social media, you'll see a lot of people like like hashtag public water or something, or make sure that they explain that they caught yeah. it in public water. That's becoming you know? a thing. Yeah, that's a good yeah. thing. Yeah. I, that kind well, of thing. Well, yeah, and then, uh, but the but like we said be above and below a club tapers off so you could be in hmm. club water or you could be you can be on public water and that doesn't mean almost anything uh, sometimes because you can you, you can sometimes see when you look at the fish you're like yeah you're on public water but that's not a public water fish right so yeah. there's some deception yeah. there is what you're saying it seems that way sometimes yeah i kind of like i don't know if you guys feel this way but i kind of would worry about it for myself that i would become dissatisfied to some extent with the the naturally available streams that we Mm. have if i was fishing like club environments constantly right you know and i'm yes i say that to kind of point out that we're not again like you said speaking towards this like we're impervious to it i think bill you seem more impervious to it than most people i know which is awesome but i think if i fished a club waterway enough it would be hard for me not to expect to catch more big fish and of course we love catching big fish they're a ton Mm -hmm. of fun and so i yeah i don't know like i think i i don't want to dilute my own experience to some extent and i don't want to become ungrateful for what we have here available to us you change that bar every time you go fishing that you're catching a you know a, a bigger fish like 18 plus inch fish uh, consistently and you catch five or six of them every time you go out, you should question, you know, is that a, is something to set up? Is it a set up? Right. Yeah. Is it a setup? Uh, what you said about diluting Trevor is perfect. I have a friend who took his kid fishing. We've been talking about taking kids fishing. He started his kid in a club environment and all they were catching mm. was seriously fish over 20 inches all the time. His kid yeah. doesn't care. His kid does not care about, you know, Fish in a regular wild trout stream. Doesn't care. So the dilution of the experience, that's a great way to put it. Yeah. All right. Thanks for the discussion, guys. That was excellent. Uh, So I think it's important to recognize the exceptional value of wild trout and to understand the limited value of the stock trout. We should not get them confused. Uh, By pushing for regulations that protect wild trout and enhance their habitat, we can prepare for a better future. By choosing to showcase wild trout over hatchery fakes, we send a signal. Value the wild trout. Protect it, catch it, and release it. And, yes, value the stock trout for what it is. All right, Austin, will you read us out? Yep. Remember, TroutBitten.com is a free resource for all anglers. So dig in, check it out. Navigate through the menus and find what you like. Share it, leave a comment. Use a search page if you're looking for something specific. Navigate by way of the categories and tags, too. Thank you so much for listening. Please give the show a five-star rating on Apple Podcasts and leave a comment. That really does help. 
Until next time, friends, fish hard, enjoy the day, and find your life on the water.